It's with great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Frank Booth today. Uh, Professor Frank Booth received his PhD from the University of Iowa in 1970. Uh, he worked as a postdoctoral fellow at NASA and at Washington University in St. Louis. He spent 24 years at University of Texas Southwestern Medical School um, and since 2001 has been professor at the University of Missouri where he holds appointments in the departments of biomedical sciences, medical pharmacology and physiology, nutrition and exercise science, and the Dalton Center for Cardiovascular Research. He's published 270 papers. 19 of those, or 17 of those that I've been a co-author on, um, and has been funded by NASA and NIH for more than 20 years each. Uh, he's received the highest possible awards from ACSM, Citations Award from National Institute of Health, um, Citations Award from ACSM, uh, numerous awards from the American Physiological Society, teaching honors from his time at UT Southwestern, and awards for his duties as a scientific reviewer of articles as well. Um, he was a pioneer in the field of exercise biology during the beginning part of his career, bridging the gap between molecular biology and exercise physiology. Um, in the recent decades, he's become internationally known for his work on physical inactivity, um, shifting the paradigm from what we view as sedentary and exercise conditions we typically had thought of sedentary as the control and exercise as the experimental, and that has been turned around on its head so we now properly recognize that the sedentary condition is the experimental and the exercise and is in fact the genetic control, thanks to the work that Frank has done. And uh, as much as his, he's contributed to science, his legacy will certainly outlast him. It's 50 PhD and postdocs that he's trained. 50, it's a lot, um, and many, most, many of whom have labs throughout the, the world, really. So the title of his talk, as you can see, is Royal Stockholm Philharmonic Orchestra is a Parable to Maximal Aerobic Training, an Ultimate Integration of Genes and Systems While Maintaining Homeostatic Harmony. I have no idea what it means. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to let Dr. Booth take it from here and hopefully explain to us uh, what he's going to talk about. So, thank you. So the healthy body is like the paramonic orchestra, a good one, okay? If something goes wrong and someone has a wrong note, you know, a part of the body gets sick, then they aren't the philharmonic orchestra, okay? So that's sort of the lead title is, is why is you, particularly in the room, are all healthy? How can that be, you know? Because, you know, everything's working in sync, okay? And exercise is a physical activity is an important thing because it challenges the system. And I'll come back to that in the talk. It, you know, you, when you go and exercise, you're really stressing the system, and you're, how does the body handle that? So we're going to talk about basically uh, more about the public health and less about the mechanisms of exercise. Let's see here. Okay. Huh? Uh, Did you have to use the arrows. Oh, the arrows. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it freezes up. There you go. Okay. Just okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is the outline of the talk. We'll get introduction. I want to start out by a philosophy that I incorporate in my thinking, and that's from the Charles Darwin. Is survival of the fitness. And what he's saying here is, is the most important thing is being able to adapt to a change in order to live and survive. Not necessarily a peak of anything, but the ability to adapt. And in my research, in varying the fields, I like to look at the whole body. And there are two that really come to mind. 
what are the, what, and there are others, but what really stresses the body? One is maximal exercise, and one is going into shock from loss of blood. All body systems have to work together to keep you alive. So that's really a maximal stress. And I sort of use this quote from a, a group of investigators uh, from California uh, who have looked at the selective philosophy, and the selective advantages of increased activity are not subtle, but are rather central to uh, survival and reproduction. In other words, how do we perpetuate the species? An animal with greater stamina has the advantage that is really comprehensible in selective terms. And a lot of you think, well, fights and stuff like that. And that is part of selection uh, 500 years ago. It can sustain greater levels of pursuit or flight and gathering of food or avoid becoming the food, you know, avoiding an animal eating a human. It is superior in, in, in te territorial defense or invasion that will be more successful in mating. These advantages appear to us to be worth an increase in energetic costs. That means you have to spend a lot of energy from food you eat since they enhance capacities to give their possessor the ability to increase energy intake to meet new energy demands. That was your great, great, great grandparents. Okay, now things are easy. And I have rewritten, this was written in 80, and uh, how would I revise Darwinism? And we've eliminated essentially infectious diseases. So lifespans are a lot longer. You're not you don't have your peers dying in infancy or in, in school. So I've rewritten this is to talk about post-reproductive -re success. Everybody lives to be able to redu uh, reproduce today, not 500 years ago. So success, as Darwin said, really is outdated, at least in my opinion. And an animal no longer has to have a greater stamina because you drive cars, you know, animals are behind bars and all that stuff at zoos. Uh, and almost everybody reaches reproductive age, so there's no selection before reproductive age. No is a strong word. There's minimal selection of species before re reproduction because everybody can reproduce, or most, all, almost everybody. And usually that you don't have to be highly fit so you can run, and run from the prey that's trying to eat you or something. So the, ch the challenge now is you have to sustain better levels of physical and mental fitnesses to live to an old age without ending up in a nursing home. I am really against nursing homes. That is the worst thing. You don't want to go there, okay? But that's where a lot of you in, your, in this room are going to end up. And some of the things I'm against are doing research is to try to set stages where humans live long enough, they don't become incapacitated, so they have to end up in nursing homes. Because if you have parents or uh, grandparents more likely to go in nursing homes, that's, that to me is the wrong way to end life without going in great detail. So we started with the first slide about what's called homostatic harmony. And what that means is the body under great stress can work like the philosophic or orchestra and uh, play a good, you know, music. Okay, everything works together. <clears throat> and one of the themes of the talk is going to be high fitness is related to low chronic disease. Okay? You don't want heart disease, you don't want uh, Alzheimer's, uh, you don't want diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Okay, you need to be physically fit because you're not going to prevent it 100%, but you're going to lessen your chances of getting it. And that's what we're trying to study. And the next three slides, we're going to look at these, uh, the next series of slides, we're going to look at how low cardiovascular fitness leads to you're dying sooner, you're getting more chronic diseases, and having uh, the chances of, when you reach 60, getting Alzheimer's.
So for mortality, low max blotching uptake is one of the strongest predictors of death. And basically, I'll come to it a little later, we all start with high maximal oxygen consumption. That's the amount of oxygen we can burn for calories. And uh, what, uh, you know, when we're exercising. And uh, when that falls to a certain level in males and females, and I'll mention that, the rate of chronic, or the prevalence of chronic diseases, that means how many people per population number, get chronic diseases goes way up. So one of the strategies I'm going to mention is, is we want to keep your maximal oxygen consumption up. And the sort of the background of this is this paper that was published uh, almost two decades ago in one of the premier medical journals, and the quote is, exercise capacity is the more powerful predictor of death, mortality, among men, and at that point in science, women were not really being studied, <laughs> than the established risk factors for cardiovascular disease. But this quote also applies now to women. And here's the data. And the data, what we're looking at is this is the lowest 20% of aerobic capacity. Aerobic capacity is the maximal amount of oxygen or the maximum amount of calories you can burn per minute when you're exercising aerobic or in endurance-wise, running or swimming or something like that um, per minute. And here is the lowest 20%, and this is the relative risk of death. And here's the highest 20%, and you can see that when the values are in the highest 20%, greater than 13, and compare it to the lowest 20% in this study, uh, that is uh, a value of uh, lower than six met, six, one met, is the resting oxygen consumption. So that'd be six times your maximal oxygen consumption, or not maximal, six times your resting oxygen consumption. They're just dropping from 13 to six aerobic capacity. The risk of death goes up almost fivefold. Okay? That's a pretty amazing number because most of the other chronic diseases like hypertension and so forth, it's in diabetes, it's only twofold. So this factor is a really important factor to uh, keep you from getting these chronic diseases. And this is just looking at it another way uh, and I sort of explained it is, is here is the drop from uh, the lowest 20% or having uh, six times re resting oxygen consumption to 13 times resting oxygen consumption. You lower your risk of death fivefold. Here's the survival, well, just the same type of analysis looking at a narrow range when you go from eight METs, which is eight times your resting oxygen consumption at max, to five-fold that, your rate of surviving in this study was lower 40% if you had the higher number. So the point I'm making is, is there's a really good connection between how long you live and what your maximal oxygen consumption or maximal aerobic capacity is. And it's stronger than most or all, any chronic disease. And this is basically just in words what I bet, which is said in this investigator in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of the ma major uh, clinical journals, is that it's the strongest predictor of the risk of death, what I'm talking about today. That's excluding infectious diseases. This is chronic diseases. And what basically it is, is for every one MET drop uh, in treadmill performance, uh, you increase your risk of, a of death 12%. So when you drop from 13 METs to 12 METs, your risk of dying goes up 12%. That's not the next day, but it's going to be over your lifespan. And just to point out, this is not a small study. It had over 2,000 people citing it in the medical literature. And I've re-edited the above from the way it was written to the following. Our, my the way I would interpret it is, is for every one met decrease in treadmill performance, it's associated with a 10 or 11 percent deterioration in survival. So this again, I'm trying to impress on you. This is an important phenomenon, 
and you probably don't even haven't really ever heard about it. It's not in the headlines in the paper. People don't talk about it. Uh, because, in my opinion, why it is, it's so complex, it doesn't really hit the medical research field. It's very difficult to get an answer of how this is caused. So let's look at chronic diseases. I've sort of given you an over, overview, and I'm going to look at the now. We're going to go from death to chronic diseases. If you have low aerobic capacity, low maximal oxygen consumption, here is the fold increase in chronic diseases that's going to happen. And the key thing is, is, and I'll show it on a slide, for males, you can drop your maximal oxygen consumption to 43 mils per kilo per minute. And you really don't have an increase in maximum or an increase in, in chronic diseases. Females, it's a little lower, 36. It's probably because females have smaller muscle mass. So as long as you can, what I preach is as long as you keep above those numbers, you're probably at almost very low risk of getting chronic diseases. But when you get below that, I'm going to show you that it increases many fold, 10, 20 fold. So looking at the two genders, here's the risk when you go from uh, uh, low fitness to high fitness, low being low, you can see the risk for women. Once you get below this 36 number, it's increasing 40 to 50 fold. It's a pretty big increase, okay? Men, actually, women do worse on this, okay? Because for men, on the next slide, they only increase 30-fold, the same parameter. So there is a sex or gender difference in this phenomenon. Now, one thing I did was is to try to emphasize that inactivity causes chronic diseases. I took some time and went to the medical literature, and I did a very comprehensive search. And what I came out with is that when you have low physical activity, this is not just research from me, it's from research all over the world, the health benefits of physical activity related to 40 chronic diseases. Right? There's no other condition that gets close to 40. Okay? A lot of people think of exercise, let's go watch the game or let's play the game. There's another part of being physically active and that is staying healthy and living longer and being free of chronic disease. And so it just isn't one area of the body, brain, metabolic diabetes, aging, you age faster, cancer, there's certain types of cancer you're more likely to get if you have low aerobic capacity, you'll get more digestive diseases, bone, cardiovascular. So it's all over the body. It just isn't one organ in the body or one system. And uh, this is the lack opposite way is, is that morbidity, uh, which means you're getting the disease, or mortality, which means you're dying, are uh, increased because of this being if you're physically inactive. And again, that 43 number for men and 36 for women, as long as you can stay about that number. So, you know, public health message is, is keep physically active because in my mind, I want to fight as long as I can to stay above at least the male number. So I took those 40 diseases and I put them in by uh, where they occur in the body. And this is just 14 of them, I think. And of 13 of them, about two or one's in two of the areas, but they hit the whole body. It's just a whole body thing, okay, when you're physically inactive. And recent epide epidemiological literature, epidemi epidemiology is where people look at people who get disease and they look and see what factors are associated with that disease and then come up with the potential cause of the disease and that's called epidemiology. And they, it's, it's well established that if you're physically inactive, you're more likely to get chronic diseases. And to sort of emphasize this, I'm going to look at death Okay, because I always like to say that death's a pretty uh, conclusive biological marker. Okay, you know when someone's dead, it's not an argument about it. And what's amazing is the statistics. And these statistics come from the U.S. government, government employees at the Centers for Disease Control, and I've been, it's my inclination and I've sort of had it uh, verified to me that they've underestimated the number I gave you because it's a political thing. 
So these are not overestimates. If anything, they're underestimates. 11% of the health care expenditures in the U.S. are due to uh, chronic diseases, okay, and, or health or healthcare costs. 11.11% of the health care costs in the U.S. are caused by chronic diseases. So what are the U.S. health care costs? How much money? You pay for it. $3.5 trillion per year, and it's going up. A hundred billion. I mean, it's going up a tenth of a trillion every year. Okay, so this problem I'm talking about is going to bankrupt you when you raise your family. Someone's got to pay for it. Chronic diseases are increasing, and uh, and physical <coughs> inactivity is related to 11 percent. And another way to look at this is if you make the calculations and you say, okay, I'm not going to pay. This is if I'm not going to pay for physical inactivity for eight years, it's 11 percent. 11 percent times nine is 99 percent. So in the ninth year, that number means that every ninth year, the total health care cost in the U.S. is due to physical inactivity. Okay? And that is, in my workings, not a number that rings any bells in D.C. Okay? They could care less. So back to the Philharmonic Orchestra. Okay? Your bodies in this room right now are Philharmonic Orchestras. Okay? They're, they're working. My body's starting to be challenged because I'm older. Parts of my body are starting to go off tune. Okay? One important part is it's going to be a crisis for you when you get older. Right now, 5.7 million U.S. people have Alzheimer's. The number is going to go up to over 13 million by about 2030. Okay? Who's going to pay for it? Nursing homes cost $100,000 a year. You have Alzheimer's for four years. That's 400000 start budgeting, okay? So one of the research things we're looking at in our lab is, is, and I won't be able to show much of the data today, is, is how can physical activity prevent Alzheimer's? And the bottom line is, is prevent it before it starts. Because Alzheimer's is, is a very bad disease because you can't go in and do brain transplants. What happens in all, all, Alzheimer's is the nerves tangle up. So you got to when you're going to do exercise, you got to hit it before that occurs, which is called my cognitive impairment. I'm not going to show the data today, but we have a method in the lab for exercise that we can prevent mild cognitive impairment in rats that have been given uh, a dr uh, means to cause them to have chronic in impairment. And so there are ways to exercise to prevent some of this stuff. And I want to show you some of the data because. I'm going to show you what could happen to you in 50 years, okay? Well, basically, Alzheimer's doesn't start till the late 60s. That's why I say 50 years. Maybe it's 40 years. Okay, this is VO2 max. That's what the lecture is. Here is the age versus the uh, measurement of cognitive function. This is the total words that you gain in a tr trial in, in a, in a uh, given period of time. And here's the lowest oxygen consumption is the solid line, that's 21. And the highest oxygen consumption is 37. You can see that the immediate recall of a fact is greater when you have a higher maximal oxygen consumption. This is human data. Now the data is sort of flipped in this, in this record. We're going to look at total errors that are made in both, both uh, measurements. This is going to be global cognitive status, and this is going to be visual memory. And now the lowest maximal oxygen consumption is the line that goes up most for you're going to have the most total errors, and the dashed line is the 37 maximal oxygen consumption. It's about one half. And the same thing for visual memory. So being physically active, there's no drug for Alzheimer's, okay? No drug. There's, some, there's, there's a hint of one, but it's many years off. And uh, so everybody that gets 
and gets out of mild cognitive impairment and gets into Alzheimer's, there's no cure. Okay, so what I'm arguing here is the, is the cure is to prevent it before it happens. And our data is suggesting it's physical uh, activity that can prevent it or physical inactivity can make it happen. Aging and the disruption of harmony. Okay, the orchestra is playing off tune. What happens? Okay, so we've gone from low cardiovascular fitness increases both uh, morbidity, uh, increase in chronic diseases and mortality, increase in death. And now we're going to look at how maximal oxygen consumption falls with aging, with inactivity, and how you could change your lifestyle to slow that. And these are the four areas I'm going to go over. We'll talk first about the decline uh, in life. When's your maximal oxygen consumption basically going to fall? In your, in your mid-20s. If you're exercising real hard, they might be later in the close to 30. So you peak in life. So there's, there's a number of strategies I will mention. Here's the data for men and women from age 20 to age 80. And as I mentioned earlier, women have a lower maximal oxygen consumption uh, uh, because they have a lot smaller muscle mass than men, but they're both falling and the men are catching up. Now, what's the effect of physical activity? So here's a study where they looked at 80-year-old men. They were lifelong endurance athletes, and they're the black dots. Here's the healthy, untrained 80-year-old people. They're the open dots. So if we go in at 80 years of age, and we take the average oxygen, average oxygen consumption for these people that, are that have been training their whole life. We go over here and see where it intersects the 50 percentile line and come down here, which is way above the, uh, the line would be here, so it would even hit. How many decades have we changed? Three, name me a drug that's going to decrease the aging of any system in the body by three decades. And this is multiple systems, okay? So you're young, you can make your choice, at least in this country still, that if you get physically active, you can delay the loss of your maximal oxygen consumption, and then I've shown you all the data that's related to trying to keep above those numbers to keep from getting the chronic diseases. And as I mentioned, my goal, which I'll fail because I don't have enough time and it's going to take decades, is to keep people out of nursing homes. It's the worst thing that can happen to you. Okay, at what age does maximal oxygen consumption first decline? Now, we did a study in rats, and I had a very talented graduate student who <coughs> took rats and actually ran them to maximal oxygen consumption 11 times over a, um, uh, I think it was a 16-week period. That's amazing, because that rat has to do it voluntarily. And he was very good at getting the rats to run to maximal oxygen consumption. And uh, any electric shock was only used a slight bit, and it was only used maybe on a couple later in life. So this was pretty voluntarily. And what we see here is we see the measurements. When the rat was at puberty, it would be about 10 weeks old. And when the maximal oxygen consumption started to fall, it started to fall about 19 weeks of age. And then it fell for about the next four to five weeks. And about 22, 23 weeks old, it was flat. And what you can see is what have the animals were separated. These were these are animals from the same litter. Rats have many pups, babies, and we can split them into the two groups randomly. And the animal and the pups, so they're pretty much genetically the same. The only difference is, is that one has a voluntary running wheel and the other doesn't. And the animal that had the voluntary running wheel, uh, you can see that it had a higher uh, ma maximal oxygen consumption most of its life that we looked at independent of where we were on the stage of uh, aging. 
And what we did is, is we, there were, obviously we don't have a lot of animals in here, so we, these are the dates, the ages we sacrificed and look at samples to try to understand why this is happening. But the point of the slide is, is that being physically active in your teenage years and your low adult years, actually, and these, if you're, if you're a rat, okay, uh, this, I can't extrapolate this totally to humans, you know, you're going to have that higher maximal oxygen consumption, which I've already shown you, is an advantageous to staying healthy. And basically the difference was this is 25% higher throughout the period. And this was the peak, at which, this is the age which it's dropped, so we did some sand, we tried to figure out why, is, why does maximal oxygen consumption start to fall? And we used a drug, which at that time said was good to get people to live longer, and the drug did no good. And we really didn't follow up. We haven't f finished the study yet to answer the question I raised, is, is what is causing that maximum oxygen consumption to fall? Because if we can figure that out, then we can keep people out of nursing homes and, and living longer and being healthier. Now, another study which is done, and this was associated with NASA. I wasn't involved with it. Uh, in astronauts in space, what happens to them? They atrophy. There's no gravity. Without gravity, they lose muscle mass, bone mass. Uh, they, their bodies just start to fall apart. And so this was a study that was done a number of decades ago. They took five medical students in the first year of medical school in the summer and made them go to bed for 21 days. And after the 21 days, this is their maximal oxygen consumption fell a quarter, 27%, just lying in bed. So this isn't, this isn't a, you know, a small change. Then they retrained them, and then they looked at them 40 years later. When they retrained them, they came back to the pre-bed rest levels. And what happened is, is that three weeks of bed rest was the equivalent of 40 years of life. The maximal oxygen consumption felt about a quarter in the first, uh, in, the, in those 21 days when they were just 21 or 22 years old. And then they retrained and then they all became physicians because they were in medical school. And 40 years later, they were at the level that they were at after three weeks of bed rest when they were just 20. So they made, they made that system age 40, in 40 years, in three weeks, they made that system age 40, and for what happened to them in 40 years. So, and again, that's showing you the physical inactivity component. Okay, this is another way to look at it. This is a study that was done in Ball State University, that's in Indiana. And what they did is they had people that were high trained, fit trained, that means high trained, they really were at, uh, training like athletes. Fit trained would be, well, more like you all potentially if you train. And then they had untrained, and then they had a group that was uh, just old, that started at a different time point. And so what's the effect of, well, this is human data, and so you can see that, that slide I showed you earlier, the group that was high trained their whole life, here's their maximal oxygen consumption, which is higher than the group that was sedentary. And the fit trained were a little less than the high trained, but they were parallel. And the people that started here at 50 years of age instead of starting at 30 years of age, they actually fell off because we didn't see that. And with aging, the loss of maximal oxygen consumption seems to accelerate. Okay, and that may be the fact that people can't exercise as hard. Now this is another interesting thing, and we're going to go to the analogy of how much does it take, okay? And I'm going to argue that one of the most modulable things for aging is maximal oxygen consumption, okay? It's, it's easier to manipulate maximal oxygen consumption than it is to prevent the loss of muscle, skeletal muscle mass with aging. And so, 
The untrained group lost, their, lost this much max velocity consumption, the fit trained this much, the high fit lost less, and there were two highly fit men in the study that did not lose their max velocity consumption, and they did, over that 20 year period, they did not lose any max velocity consumption, but they were exercising the same volume over a 20 year period. So in my mind, that is human data that proves that if you can continue to exercise at the same workload, you don't have to have this aging effect. And the question for you all probably to answer, not me, is, is why? What's, what's the basis of this? If you can figure that out, we can keep people out of nursing homes. Okay, reestablishing homeostasis through uh, physical uh, activity. And we're getting moving along. We're going to finish early, probably. Um, another experiment we do, I did, and this sort of relates to the uh, data I showed you earlier by Ryan Todebush on aging and maximal oxygen consumption. This is the distance run. And so one of the things that I argue is, is I can stand up in front of a nursing home and tell them to get up and exercise, and they aren't going to do it. Okay. And I can show them all the data, and they aren't going to do it. And I can show 50-year-olds, same thing. Okay? The major problem is, is I can give you a talk, and none of you are going to go out and exercise. Okay? Particularly if you're 30, 40, 50, 60, 70. Something happens in the body that you become less likely to voluntarily exercise as you get old. And so that's one of the things we're studying in my lab, is, is what is changing in the brain? that makes people sit in, you know, around tables and just sit there all day or sit in a chair. And they aren't in, they aren't in wheelchairs today. And they don't want to move. So something's changing in the brain. And what's, well, that's one of the things we're trying to figure out. And some of the data that shows this is here in that study I showed you where the max box consumption, this is a distance run. This is voluntary. And so you can see the rats are voluntarily running less and less to, to about 26 weeks of age. And if you take them out to a year, the male rats will stop running, the female rats will probably be still running a little bit. Okay? So what in the world is causing people to, you know, voluntarily not exercise and have to end up sitting in nursing homes in the last few years of their life, which is not a pleasant way to reward you for your life. And then look at the curves, and this is kind of interesting because the, the running distance that the animals did voluntarily peaked at around age nine weeks, whereas max melodic consumption peaked about 18 or 19 weeks, or started to fall. They both, I said peaked, but they started to fall. What does that tell you? It tells you that there are two biological control mechanisms that are probably acting independently. So if you're going after mechanisms to, quote, make a pill or get people exercise, you have to study two different, two different pathways, okay? It's not, this is not simple. And it goes back to survival of the fittest. You know, the, you've got genes because your people that you, early on, your way ancestors survived, okay? You have those genes. So that's what I just briefly said, and this is Ryan Todebush. And then they raised the question, what's the role of the brain? So the last couple of years I've been studying how the brain uh, works with aging and exercise. And I needed, a, I needed an animal model. So I used uh, voluntary running and what, one thing we did in our lab is we tried to see is being physically inactive related to genes. In fact, I know when I turned in a grant to study this, that came back from NIH saying, well, you're dumb. They didn't use that word, but it, you, all it does is you're reversing the exercise pathways. We're not going to fund you. So I did this study. It took about 10 years. And basically, it showed that the NIH was wrong, that there are genes for physical inactivity, and uh, I was the first one to show that in animals, and here's the data that showed it is, is you selectively breed animals 
The Germans did this. You may have read this about in World War II. They wanted to win the Olympics, so they bred people together. They had the good female athletes with the good male athletes and hoped they'd win gold medals. Well, I did the same thing here, but I basically did it on a scheduled order of breeding, where in the first generation, male one and family one would breed against female and family two, and then in generation two, male one would breed against female and generation, I mean, in family three. So you had, you, you uh, minimized inbreeding, okay, which was important for the validity of the study. What this study showed is, is the animals I was choosing to be high increased and then plateaued about a week four, <coughs> generation four. The, at, at four weeks, selecting animals to run road, low, there was no change. And there was no change until about uh, generation five or six, and by generation 10, the lows are hardly running. So if you have two different time courses of change, what does that tell you? It says that there are probably two sets of genes. So we have a set of genes that want to make us exercise, and we have a set of genes that want us to not exercise. And then about 18 months later, the same study, I don't know if I have it here. Um, yeah, that's, here's the study. This is a study from Europe. In Europe, birth records are government records or government property from birth, not in the U.S. yet, okay? So, basically what they were able to do is take 55-year-old people who were twins, either mono or disagati twins, and then they were able to see which twin was more active than the other, and they were able to use some formula to figure out how much of the twins in activity was due to genes or the, the living environment, okay? What they found out is about one-third of the sedentary activity, the more sedentary twin, was due to genes. And the other two-thirds were due to uh, environmental factors. You know, the loss of being, becoming more sedentary with aging. And that's what this figure is showing you. So to sort of summarize what I've said to this point is basically the clinical importance of the highest possible VO2 throughout, throughout life is important, okay? And one of them is for health, avoiding chronic diseases, 40, quality of life, look at people that have chronic diseases, their quality of life is lower, and death, you're going to live longer, okay? So one formula that I think about to counter this is what you have to do for maximal oxygen consumption, you want to be physically active throughout, throughout your life, but particularly you want to be active so you get to the highest value at, in your 20 year of age. That's sort of like how many flights of stairs do you got to go up? Okay, you want to go up more flights of stairs, have a higher maximal oxygen consumption because what's going to happen is you're going to start to fall down the stairs and when you get to the bottom, you're dead, okay? And so if you're at a higher level on the stairwell, you take longer to fall, and maybe you're going to die of something else before you die of getting falling down at the bottom of the stairs. So you want to de de delay the decline after you're 20 years of age, because it's really hard, human studies show it's really hard to increase maximal oxygen consumption after 20. So when you reach most of you at that point now, it's really... You're right, probably at your peak unless you really go all out and exercise harder than you really would concede to do. I've mentioned these numbers before. These are numbers I really didn't show you the data, but the chronic disease, if your maximal oxygen consumption falls below there, it goes from flat and all of a sudden it starts going up in males and females. No one understands why. But, so you want to fight, like I say, like, I use the term hell to keep above those numbers, okay, as long as you can, because then you're not going to get, your chances of getting chronic diseases are much lower. And you want to do that as long as you can keep above those numbers and keep active. So I'm, I'm preaching a lifelong physical activity. Uh, now I'm just, there's just a couple slides left. I want to give you a little flavor of what we're doing in the lab. We want to know why, uh, what's wrong with grandma 
that she cannot get up and play with her kids, her two-year-old, and uh, what's changed in her brain? Or it could be in another part of the building of the body and feeding the brain. And so what we did is, is we know we have a group of rats. I showed you they're motivated to perform on the wheel. We performed in rats that don't want to run on the wheel. And there's now methods where we can go and do a census on all the messenger RNAs in the muscle, okay, and find out how many there are. Just like every 10 years we have a census in the U.S., I can go and do a census on a piece of skeletal muscle and be able to say how many mRNAs do you have for various genes. And from that I can start to try to figure out maybe what's changing in your muscle or in the brain that causes what I've been talking about in my uh, talk. And we picked out a gene that we looked at and uh, we did some experiments and I'm not going to go through them, I'm just going to briefly show you. What we're doing is, is we have this gene and we can stick it back into the rat brain. Okay? It's run by a virus. Okay? And they're going to be doing this in humans. They already are doing viral gene transplants into the human eye. Okay? That's not far from the brain. So this is, this is, not, this is going to be possible in humans at some point where you can go in and do gene therapy. It's called gene therapy in a certain part of the brain. So we're doing that. We're doing gene therapy in a certain part of the rat brain and seeing if we can make the rat run more. Okay? And I'm arguing with you that clinically, within the last year, the U.S. government has approved eye gene therapy in humans. So the, this is the amount of the mRNA. What we're going to do is try to increase it. Uh, this is our wild type animals. I, these are animals that don't, were not selected. These are animals that selected be low voluntary runners. This gene's low in the low voluntary runners. What we did is we did a uh, looking at the uh, distance of running voluntarily versus the amount of this gene, and we saw that there was a, a, a uh, fairly decent correlation. And then we tr did what I explained. We put that gene back into one part of the brain. It's called the nucleus accumbens. And we wanted to look at to see if the rat would run more. And here's the gene. And what this gene, I'm not going to explain the whole pathway. And what we did is, is we were able to, this is the percentage, this is the showing you, proving you that the gene was expressed in, in that part of the brain. And here's the animals running without the gene. These are the litter mates that did not get the gene therapy. They just got a, uh, a, a, uh, an injection without the gene. And here's the animals that got the injection of the gene. And you can see these are females, so the animal has a four-day estrus cycle instead of a 28-day uh, or monthly uh, immenstrual cycle. Rats have a very short cycling. And the running was in the cycle because Rats are more active at proestrus, okay? So we were able to repeat that, and we were able to get the animals to run more, putting this, using gene therapy, putting it into the animal's brain. What was, to me, was more exciting was it didn't work in the lows, I mean in the wild type. And it's more exciting to me because something was working to prevent that gene from working. And if I can figure out what that was, what's preventing it from working, and then I can overcome it, and maybe I can have something to make people who are wild type or just normal run more, okay? So the most exciting part of this was uh, well, the part that did not work, but it actually did work. And one of the hints was is the overexpressed genes seem to be six, uh, suppressed, and these are some of the other mRNAs are related to it. I won't take time on it. And almost in conclusion, we're looking at this gene that's downstream of this to see if we could have another target to try to see if we could do gene therapy. And here it's really high. The phosphorylated CREP is really high in the lows. So here's another potential gene we want to go into the brain of the rat do gene therapy like I'm arguing probably could be done in humans, maybe not for this, but, but very close because eyes are part of the brain, um, and try to get these animals to run more.
So that's another thing we'll be just starting in the lab pretty soon. So conclusion. Basically, what I'm trying to say is there are molecular pathways, messenger RNAs, proteins, that cause you to be physically inactive. They're probably in more than in the brain. They're probably in skeletal muscle and talk to the brain. And if we can find those, maybe we can keep the old grandma out of the wheelchair and able to play with the grandchildren. And that's the aim. And here's the two genes that I've, we're working on now. We want to try to fight the couch potato. Uh, and here's a picture of an orchestra that's not in synchrony, OK? It may be your school orchestra, okay? It's not Philharmonic, okay? So this is, a, this is a sick orchestra. What we want to do is to make you and your kids in the future have a longer life where all the genes are in harmony. Okay, since you're young, I've been around a while, I've had 11 bosses. Okay, some have been good, some of them been bad. Uh, this guy was my boss, where are we, for a couple years. He was not a nice man, he won the Nobel Prize. Uh, this guy wasn't really nice either, but we got along. Uh, some of these other people were real, they all taught me something. So the, the, what the point in here is this, I've had 11 people being my boss, and I've seen a lot of things, and uh, there's a lot to learn from people even that there's a dislike, okay? And so that's my background. Some of these people are really fantastic individuals. Most all of them are, except maybe that one. <laughs> he knows it. Here are the people in the lab. Uh, Tom is the brains behind all the stuff in the lab. He started with me 20 years ago. Uh, Coulter's now looking, well, this is the wrong slide, he now has a position as a postdoc in Oregon, not far from here. Uh, uh, Taylor's uh, a student is going to be with me another two years. Greg is starting his third year at the Mayo School of Medicine as a postdoc. And uh, Mao is my new grad student, and uh, these people support me in uh, my work. They're all uh, people in the department uh, who administrate me and if there's time for questions because we are 20 minutes after the hour there's it was originally time to be 65 minutes and we did it in less <laughs> I left out 10 slides any questions if you if you don't have any yeah Yeah. Yeah, they definitely did. In fact, the paper's written that they went under, underwent an intense training period. In fact, one of the federal regulations on using humans in research is, and it was a way that's 50 years ago, even then, is you really want, you have to tr give them training to recover to where they were. So they did recover. But it was, uh, it was, it was in Dallas, so it was a hot summer. <laughs> and they worked hard. <laughs> and it was at the end of the summer, and then they went to be second year med students. Uh, how long did it take for them to recover? Uh, probably, uh, I would guess, four weeks. Because of the timing in the summer, they probably only had three months off. Yeah. Now, when you get older, you're not going to recover <laughs> as fast or maybe all the way. So these people were male, they were 20, 21, okay? So it should be the same for females. But uh, it, it's well known in the literature that the older you get, uh, they were still in that period where they could turn on genes better. Mm -hmm. But people my age have less ability to adapt and less ability to recover from any kind of trauma. Okay, it's much slower in old people than in young people. And we really don't understand the mechanisms of that yet. 
Yes. So you talk a lot about stress of the body and how that's a good thing. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on the other part of that, which is rest. And studies that show, you know, is there some kind of optimal between stressing the body and resting it yeah. to achieve kind of a VO2 max that is fairly high? I'm going to answer two ways. And if I forget, re forget to re get to your question enough okay. and re-answer me. Actually, there's when you talk about stress, there's an inner difference between intermittent stress and continuous stress. Okay, if I take an animal and I stress him by running, he the animal has 23 hours to recover. If I did that for 24 hours a day, maybe not running, and had the animal continuous stress, and there are examples like that, where you give a stress continuously, it's harmful to the animal. Acute stress and allowing the animal to recover allows the animal to adapt. That means that the animal develops mechanisms in the animal so that when it sees the stress the next time, it's less stressed. Okay? So that's, that's an important concept is that if you're having an argument with your mate or your friend and you just keep it up and up, you're going you're to have more stress than if you go out and exercise so that you know and then rest for the next day or two okay so there's a difference and there's literature like that that a pulsatile event is a different biological reaction than a continuous event now you're quite i wanted to say that before i answered your question so remind me of your question so i'm just wondering how much rest is optimal uh if you're trying to you know be an elite athlete you know, resting is usually a, a really hard part, right? Because everyone wants to train more. So I'm just curious as to your thoughts. Yeah, I'm going to answer that for the lay and then for the athlete, okay? For the lay, there's an interesting phenomenon. Like someone tells me I should be lifting weights three times a week, and I do it two, and I'm still gaining strength. That's because older people recover more slowly, okay? It takes longer after a bout of exercise for me to recover from that exercise bout, just because I'm older, okay? So there, there, there and then there's this, there's proviso that resist, or endurance training, which is running, swimming, uh, biking, you can do that five to seven times a week. You can only lift weights at your age three times a week because you need a longer recovery period. And what I'm arguing is two times a week for me because I'm, you know, the worst thing I can do is do too much and harm, hurt myself, and then I'm going to digress too much. I got to keep even. So there's not a simple answer. Depends on what you know. Now, if you're an athlete, I have a guy in, the, in my room, uh, Taylor, in my lab. One of the, he, 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 li he goes to the weight room and religiously for two hours a day. You know, and uh, well, maybe it's one to two, uh, but. He varies the muscle groups, okay? So I'm not really a, a resistance exerciser. I just do that for health. But the, he, he'll train one part of the, one muscle group and then give it a rest. The next day it's another group and gives it a rest. So he's actually in five to seven days a week during resistance training. But for the same muscle group, it may be only two times a week, okay? So there are different levels of that too and age. You know, it's really hard to lift weights because, you know, you have to go somewhere, pay for it, and it's inconvenient. It's easy to do endurance training. So there's so many things that are involved. Is that sufficient? Yeah, yeah. yeah there's no magical number, okay? And there's also other types of uh, training, which is uh, uh, training so you don't trip and fall, you know, uh, coordination training. People don't talk about that that much. But when I'm going downstairs now, I got to hold the rail because of my knee, my ankle, not my ankle, my heel sometimes hits the back of the, of the stair. And so I got to hold. So when you get older, you lose your coordination. So I got to train for coordination too. No one thinks about that. Or older people, what, well, that's one of the people that kills old people is they fall and they have trauma to their body for the surgery, and they never really recover. So, you know, there's, there's more than, there's endurance training or aerobic, there's resistance, there's strength training, there's also coordination training, and all these things are using different neural pathways. 
Well, you've been a great group. And I really i am glad that Matt is your instructor because he was a great student of mine and I'm proud of him. So thank you very much. <laughs>